we have so little time. As the Buddha said, even if you have a long life, it's a hundred years, which may seem long. But as you're approaching the end, you look back and there's nothing. Time eats everything as it eats itself. We're encouraged to have unlimited mind states, unlimited goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. But our resources are limited. Time, energy. Which means that we have to choose our issues very carefully. Notice that after the Buddha's awakening, the issue that he focused on was one that all of us have in common, which is we want happiness and yet our actions lead to suffering. And unlike some teachers who try to make us embarrassed about our desire for happiness or denounce it as selfish, he said there's nothing wrong with the desire for happiness. It's simply we go about it the wrong way. So if you can focus on this issue and clear up this issue, you take care of everything else. So we have to look at the issues we carry into the practice. Old wounds, old battles, old issues. How many of them are worth carrying, continuing to carry? How many issues can we take on and actually handle them properly? We hear about people who find that they only have a few months left to live, and they suddenly change their way of living. They get a sense of what's important what's not important to them, and let the unimportant things fall aside. It's good that they do this. It's a shame that they have to wait until the last three months. As the Buddha said, you should be prepared to go at any time, which means you have to really pare down your, your issues. I was reading a while back about a woman general in the army, who every day at the beginning of the day would make a list of the ten most important things that had to be done that day in order of importance. And then she'd strike out the last eight and focus on the first two. And the Buddha would have you focus on one. What's the cause of your suffering right now? Where is your suffering? This is not a selfish issue to focus on, because if you can't handle your own suffering, it tends to spill out into other people. So we owe it both to ourselves and to others to focus on what we're doing that's unskillful, and have some goodwill for ourselves, to see that our desire for happiness is something to be honored is something to be aspired to. But we want to make that genuine happiness, solid happiness, reliable happiness, harmless happiness. In other words, really wish ourselves well. We get practice with the breath. The other day we were talking about having an issue of being friends with your breath. If you can't be friends with your breath, how are you going to be friends with anybody? You have to stop and ask yourself, what's the problem? Is the breath the problem, or is there something inside? A lot of us come from other traditions where we're taught to think very little of ourselves. And either we accept that or we react in the opposite direction. But neither of those attitudes is help, helpful. You have to wish yourself well. And it's a question of whether people deserve to be happy or whether you deserve to be happy. The Buddha never talked about deserving. He was here to put an end to suffering. Whether the suffering is deserved or not, he says, put an end to it. That's pretty radical. You know, there's that story about Angulimala. It would kill 999 people. And then the Buddha taught him, 
And not too long after that, he became an arahant. A lot of people like that story. It shows that no matter what your background, there's hope. But we have to remember that at the time, there were a lot of people who were pretty upset. Here was Angulimala had killed all those people. He was getting away with literally murder. And so you could say that he deserved to suffer, but the Buddha didn't take that into consideration at all. He said, here's a person who's suffering really badly, and his suffering is spilling out and affecting other people. By curing Angulimala's suffering, or showing him how to cure his suffering, saved a lot of other people too. So if there's a question of whether you deserve to be happy or not, you learn how to put that aside, realize that that's a non-issue. The issue is that you've got actions. The mind is an active principle. Something that John Munn talked about a lot. He says it's the mind flows out. There's the, the source of the mind, like the source of a river. And things keep flowing out, flowing out. And that's the problem. It's not the things outside that are problems. It's the way we flow out towards things. And it's not going to stop. Unless we learn how to do it really skillfully. Our actions are really, really important. There was a teaching in the time of the Buddha that said that the only real things in the world are the basic elements, earth, water, wind, fire, and they had a few other elements as well. And these are solid things that really existed, and our actions were non-existent. Our thoughts were non-existent. This also meant that there was no basis for precepts. As I said, when a knife went through somebody's neck, it just went through the atoms. There was nobody there, and the movement of the knife was unreal. Only, only permanent things were real. The Buddha's teaching is the other way around. It's your actions that are real, that they have the most reality. And the world out there, the world that you experience. The world out there is not the issue. The world that you experience comes from your actions. Your actions are more solid, more powerful than your experience of earth, wind, water, fire, all the other elements. That's a pretty radical statement. This is why the Buddha keeps focusing back on what are you doing right now? Because what you're doing right now is the big shaping force in your experience. And all of us, regardless of our past, regardless of what other people have told us, have the perfect right to learn how to act skillfully, to find happiness. So learn to see the issue of genuine happiness as the big issue. Learn to see the issue of genuine suffering as the big issue, too. They go together. And have some goodwill for your own happiness. It's interesting that when the Buddha talks about people who are wealthy but extremely stingy, he doesn't say oh, that's really good that they've learned how to put aside sensual desires. He said there's something really wrong there. If they can't learn how to appreciate some pleasures for themselves, how are they going to appreciate other people having pleasure? They're going to be jealous. They're going to be resentful. So he does encourage pleasure in moderation. He says there are pleasures that are perfectly harmless for the mind. You have to look at your own mind, though, to figure out which ones are harmless for you and which ones are not, because it's not the same for everybody. And then you realize, okay, these pleasures really do give some relief to the mind, but they aren't satisfying. What would be a higher level of pleasure? And the word sukha runs everything from just plain, plain old physical pleasure, ease, well-being, all the way up to bliss, and nirvana is the ultimate sukha. So all these forms of well-being, pleasure, ease, 
happiness. They're all in a continuum. And the Buddha doesn't want you to be afraid of pleasure. He says, learn how to appreciate which pleasures are actually helpful for you on the path. And when they get in the way. The same with pains. There are some pains that are helpful for you on the path. You want to learn how to use both pleasure and pain and not be overcome by either. But the purpose of all this is to create in the mind a state of genuine well-being. When you have that well-being, what misery is there to slosh out on other people? For most of us, we're miserable and we slosh our misery out on others, thinking that we're lightening our load, but it just makes things worse. But when you can take care of this source of sloshing stuff inside, you benefit, the people around you benefit. When the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, there weren't just four interesting facts about an interesting problem. He was saying, this, he was saying, this is the big issue. The fact that you're causing yourself suffering, but you have the ability to learn how not to. So given the little time we have, this is important that we focus our energy on solving the problem that is the big problem. The problem that once it's solved, everything else gets solved. So look at your attitude toward happiness, look at your attitude toward suffering, and see if you can bring those attitudes in line. The Dharma that the Buddha taught for the purpose of putting an end to suffering and finding true happiness. These are the issues that are important. Anything that gets away, we can put aside. We read about those people in the time of the Buddha who came with this questionnaire. Is the world eternal? Is the world not eternal? Is it finite? Is it infinite? Is the soul the same thing as the body? Is it something different? What happens to an enlightened person after death? Do they exist? Not exist? Both? Neither? And to us it looks very bizarre. Now those could be big issues for people. That we tend to have our issues, and sometimes they're stranger than that. There was the monk who said he wouldn't practice the Buddha's teachings unless the Buddha gave his answer to those questions. The Buddha said, well, you're going to die before you hear me answer those questions. We all know the story about the arrow. The man is shot by the arrow, and he tells the doctor, I'm not going to take the arrow out until I find out who made the arrow, what wood it was made out of, what kind of feathers it was made with, what the cast was of the person who shot me. The person would die. We see other people's issues as ridiculous in that way. We have to learn how to see a lot of our own issues as ridiculous in that way, too, the issues that are getting in the way of our gaining the most from the fact that we've been exposed to the Buddhist teachings and we have the chance to practice them, at least for now. <laughs>